What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This episode is powered by Stick and Ball TV, the baseball and softball streaming platform. If you're a coach with a growth mindset and who wants to get better every single day, Stick and Ball is just for you. There are literally hundreds of videos from some of the best coaches on the planet, both baseball and softball, waiting just for you. Go to stickandball.tv or to the Stick and Ball mobile app to check it out. Today's episode is sponsored by What About Baseball? It's no secret that we live in a world with constant electronic distractions. Families are spending less time together and kids often can't look up from their devices. But the What About Baseball brand is here to help. What About Baseball is a family-owned, baseball-centric business whose focus is on providing the best baseball toys and accessories to bring friends and family back together to bond over the great sport of baseball. Starting with their best-selling Classic Edition board game, What About Baseball offers fun and exciting gameplay for fans of all levels, from beginner to expert. Whether you want to teach someone the basics of counting balls and strikes, or whether you are deciding if you should call the suicide squeeze, the Classic Edition board game is a proven winner and has the reviews to prove it. Even better, it's also made right here in the USA. What About Baseball would like to reward Ahead of the Curve listeners with 20% off their best-selling board game and free shipping. Go to whataboutbaseball.com backslash curve to get your special offer. Once again, that's whataboutbaseball.com backslash curve. On today's show, we have on Wes Carroll, head baseball coach at the University of Evansville. Wes is in his 14th season as the head baseball coach at the University of Evansville and has taken the program to new heights. Carroll learned the Purple Aces way growing up just a few minutes from campus in nearby Newburgh, Indiana. He also watched his older brother and former Major League infielder, Jamie Carroll, excel at shortstop and later got to experience the success the program is capable of firsthand as the four-year starter for the Purple Aces and a member of UE's 2000 NCAA tournament team. Following his college career at Evansville, Carroll was drafted in the 37th round of the Major League Baseball first-year player draft by the Philadelphia Phillies. Carroll spent the next five years playing in the minor leagues for the Phillies and later for the Montreal Expos and Washington Nationals organization. As part of the now Nationals organization, Carroll played parts of two seasons at the AAA level and retired in 2006, but not before getting to play alongside his older brother Jamie in two spring training games. Carroll returned to his alma mater in the summer of 2006 as an assistant coach and was named the 12th coach in UE baseball history on July 2nd, 2008. So on the show, we discuss how to create a family culture. We go over a year of player development, and we discuss the changes he has made since he started as a head coach at 28 years old. You're going to love this episode with Wes Carroll. Really excited to get to learn from you today. And I had your brother on, Jamie, a couple of weeks ago, which was really a really, really interesting conversation. And I got to learn a lot from him. And you guys are the first brother brother combo to be able to come on the show. So that's a really cool. And I, I, I actually, I want to take a take a step back. Did you did you guys like was it a baseball family when you guys were growing up, or was it just something that you guys were bonded together through the sport and then decided to uh, just push each other through it, or like was it a baseball family whenever you guys were born and they were like, no, you got to play baseball. We were a sports family. Uh, there was three of us boys. The oldest one, Jason. You know, Jason was 6'4", 280, uh, played football at a high level, was a really good baseball player. He's seven years older than me. Jamie's five years older than me. Jamie was the middle one, the runt of the family. He was real small and tiny. Um, but uh, And then I was the youngest. And so uh, all three of us grew up at the baseball fields, um, football fields, uh, basketball courts. Uh, we were all three very, very involved. and just so thankful that our parents uh, kept us in multiple sports for, for so long and and so very fortunate to have two older brothers to learn a lot off of. I'm so happy that you got a chance to share some time with Jamie because he is a special, uh, special person with an unbelievable story that uh, is pretty m- remarkable. His journey, um, you know, growing up through his childhood with a, a major injury in high school, you know, fighting and clawing his way at John A. Logan. His path is so unique and special and just all the unique stories that go along with it for him uh, to have a 12 plus year big league career. Uh, it truly, I'm glad people kind of got into his mindset uh, of an elite athlete and, and somebody that persevered through a significant amount. So very fortunate to have him, you know, to lean on um, my entire life, uh, very, very close to him. 
And uh, yeah, what a special, special story and special person he is. No doubt. No doubt. And so you guys grew up in the area and I guess, you know, whenever I was growing up in my small hometown of Hobart, Oklahoma, I was like, there's no way that I'm ever coming back here once I graduate. And then, you know, you go and you, you go to Evansville, you graduate, you play in pro ball for several different years. What brought you back? And was that the plan all along? No, I really didn't know. Um, my plan was to have a 10 year big league career and follow my brother's footsteps like I did, you know, my whole life. And, and, you know, I just got to a point where I was in triple A where I recognized that, um, I was just done playing the game mentally and physically. And honestly, I was, you know, just got burnt out and wanted to get away from the game altogether. Um, <clears throat> my wife uh, who I met at the university of Evansville is from this city as well. And she is obviously very tight and close with her family. She was kind of here already in a teaching uh, job role. So uh, we were going to, you know, kind of settle down into this community because it is a special, unique community um, that, that growing up in really is, a, really is a special place to me. And so when we came back home, I really didn't have a plan. I knew I had a great education from the University of Evansville to fall back on. Um, and so I kind of dove into really an exciting stage uh, of my life where uh, I didn't have to lean on baseball. And so it was truly, it was frightening and exciting at the same time uh, as I dove into a lot of different job markets and decided in order to make money, I needed to be around money. And so I went to be a stockbroker. Uh, so I, uh, for about you know six to seven months, I was in a suit every day and, uh, you know, passed the series seven, which was very rewarding for myself because that just proved myself I can do something outside of the game of baseball. And I needed that just for an overall confidence boost. But the timing kind of worked out perfect as um, as I'm going to work every day in a suit and trying to settle into a, you know, a new stage in my life. An opening uh, occurred at the University of Evansville uh, with Dave Schrag leaving um, U of E to go be the next head baseball coach at Notre Dame. And, and uh, Bill McGillis reached out to me. He was the current athletic director and and uh, I had built a, a relationship with him, just being home from pro baseball, uh, being around uh, a little bit and, and uh, just kind of built a relationship with him. Was fortunate enough to uh, be offered an assistant coaching position at 26 years old. And I, I couldn't get that suit off fast enough as I recognized uh, the game of baseball was kind of my calling and where I wanted to be. I love hearing that. And uh, again, I, I love getting to hear the background behind all of that and, and with your family. I think that that's that's an amazing, amazing thing. So you, you're you in a suit and tie every day, and then you get back. I think I read that you were the assistant for a couple of years, and then you got the head coaching job. Is that – am I accurate with that? Yes, absolutely. I was an assistant baseball coach uh, for two years. Um, and uh, with those two years, the, the head coach was let go, and, and I was 28 years old, and we had a new athletic director for a couple of years named John Stanley who just – who believed in me um, and who saw the vision that I had um, and my leadership ability to, to take over the program. And, you know, whenever I took over at U of E, I was 28 years old. I was the youngest D1 coach in the country. And, and I was a train wreck in a lot of ways. I was, and, and I just was full of energy and excitement uh, to be at my alma mater, be 28 years old. And, and, you know, coach Jim Brownlee was the head baseball coach and built this program uh, from the late seventies up to 2002 and just feeling like, Hey, I am in his office right now. Um, it hit home. It really did. And so uh, I kind of hit the ground with a lot of excitement and, and a vision of just trying to get this program to play hard. And, and we were really young. I inherited a lot of young players, but most importantly, I needed to surround myself with only two years of, you know, recruiting experience. I didn't have a lot of recruiting experience. And I think the, the most important thing that I did early on as a 28 year old is I brought in um, uh, just an amazing, an amazing college baseball coach slash recruiter and Mark Wagner. Um, they were just transitioning out of Bradley and he was available. And Mark Wagner came in and uh, did a magnificent job of just teaching me a lot. He's been in the Missouri Valley Conference um, and he recruited at such a high level from the standpoint of this was before a lot of uh, online showcases and everything started. And he just found he found aces. He, he did. He found what we needed and what we're looking for. Um, and and we kind of hit the ground running with with our first recruiting class with him and Josh Reynolds coming in. And it was just a special time as far as, you know, how we got we cultivated relationships and we got our guys to play hard and we were able to go. 
in our first year as, as a as a staff and so we just uh, really got our guys to buy into Evansville across our chest and, and playing the game the right way um, and, and then we just kind of rolled from there for the first couple of years and it was exciting it truly was and and Mark Wagner I, I tell you I, I can't believe that he's you know not a, a power five guy somewhere he is a very unique talent uh, that has uh, a great family. They live out in Colorado now, and 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 so the college baseball, uh, the college baseball world is missing him. And and I hope at some point he he decides he wants to get back in. Uh, but also here at a small private school, it's very tough. Uh, it's tough to make a living. And so he was here with me for for six years, and 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 decided to to leave and get out of the game. And and uh, he's being he's a very successful uh, person in the in the private sector. So. Uh, but that was a, he was a big influence on me. He was a, he showed me a, a, a lot of great things and I learned a significant amount off of Mark Wagner that helped me. And, and we kind of, we steered our, the direction of our program uh, in a good way. We did. I love that. And I love hearing just you fully admitting to growing. Cause I, th I think that <laughs> those who aren't admitting that they're growing or admitting that they had done some things wrong in the past still are. And so I, I'd love to hear just your thoughts on, you know, what, what are some things that you would have done differently or that you pivoted with? So you come in and you've got a ton of energy, not, a, not necessarily a ton of experience coaching. You had a ton of experience in baseball, but just what were some of the biggest things, the biggest changes that you had to make as a head coach whenever, uh, when, as you, as you started to grow through your career? Yeah, and I'm changing every day. I, I think well, they, we always say the new age kid and things like that. The, the kid deep down is still the same. He wants to be led. He wants to be communicated with. But most importantly, relationships is what I'm seeing more and more every day. And and trying to bring the self-starter out of them. I think, you know, a lot of kids, and I'm guilty. I have a 13-year-old son and I have a 10-year-old daughter. And, and I find myself, you know, picking up their, you know, candy wrappers and throw it in the trash for them. And you know, these kids get a lot of things catered to them, you know, from their schedules and, and being taken places. And, and so it's really just trying to adjust and adapt to different ways of communicating to these kids to bring out the self-starter, the assertiveness out of them. And so early on in my career, I was, a, you know, a hard-nosed kind of guy where, um, you know, if we didn't, you know, do a drill a certain way, we were going to run. I felt like the biggest way to the brain was through the feet. And that has drastically changed uh, because I see that that is, you know, detrimental and getting them to develop and, and getting them better. And so uh, we have, we've changed in a lot of those different ways. Um, you know, for me, uh, rules and regulations, I, I was fortunate to have, be around a, a lot of different coaches, managers, and people, uh, some things that I learned what to do and what not to do. And, um, you know, for me, I, I didn't have a big, long laundry list of rules uh, because if you have a that big laundry list of rules, it, it kind of backs you into corners. And the worst part of our job as leaders is the discipline aspect. And because you've got to show consistency with, with that, um, you know, overall discipline, because all eyeballs are on how you handle each person. And as soon as you start handling individuals differently and inconsistent, it shows favoritism and it really starts to drive a wedge through, you know, your overall program. Uh, and that's the basic pillars of your foundation is being able to have consistency with your discipline, no matter if you're the three hole hitter or you're the last guy on the roster type of thing, if you can show some sort of consistency. So we just had one, one rule, you know, uh, anything deemed uh, detrimental to the program, you know, is punishable by the coaching staff. And with that, you try to uh, line out certain type of different punishments and just, um, you know, how to handle different personalities. Some guys need the barking. Some guys need, you know, the, you know, the, the tone and raised voice. Other, other guys need the disappointed dad type of approach. And so it's just about figuring out how to connect and get them to understand that, you know, they need to develop a routine and consistency and, and, and follow along with the, the basic rules of the program. So I think early on, uh, I was a real stickler on how, uh, how to punish people. And, and whereas now it's, it's more of the disappointed dad and making sure getting more bought into each other. I think that's how I've changed a lot. And, and, and most importantly, how I've changed the most through my times is I have been extremely humbled. Um, I was a 28 year old, very, you know, confident, arrogant 
uh, kind of kid taking over my alma mater with energy and, and just the focus on winning and getting our guys to have that kind of fire where we run into a couple bad years. It's very humbling. And then I kind of use that word as a humbling to my ego and to my overall just um, arrogance. And I turned it into being grateful. I think that's the biggest thing as I've gotten through my 14 years is, is that word of being grateful and optimistic are drastically different than some of the other adjectives that I was early in my career, as far as, um, you know, being pessimistic and, and, and being just so driven and focused on winning where there's so many other factors that have come into place and really changed my view of how uh, I am when, you know, when, when, when things hit the fan and they're going to through the course of the game, handling myself in a drastically different manner now um, and being able to connect more with the, the new age mentality. I think uh, that's, that's where I've changed a lot, but it has always, always come from an area of being humbled because we ran into two really poor years at the University of Evansville here. And those two years humbled me drastically. Um, but we've been able to pull ourselves out of that. And I, I'm starting to, we feel like we're starting to see the light and turn the corner as a program. So uh, I have, I've changed drastically in a lot of different aspects um, and it's okay. And it's okay. And it's okay to admit that as well. Um, and, and so I think that's something that I'm proud of myself that I've been able to surround myself with great people over the years. And, and here recently, uh, my coaching staff has really helped me and assisted me with bringing in some outside perspective, views, uh, eyeballs, and just voices to kind of, you know, ease me and, and get me to, you know, be a better leader. And, and that's, I think that's the biggest thing is, is you, you are who you surround yourself with. And if you surround yourself with good people that are going to, you know, that you can continue to learn off of, you're going to ultimately be a better leader. And that's what I've been able to do here the last couple of years for sure. I love hearing that. And again, it, it just speaks to your humility to admit the different things that you guys have had to change. So definitely commend you on that for sure. Cause that's, that's sometimes that's not easy to do. So whenever you talk about almost having no rules or just like anything that would embarrass the program is against our standards here. What are some different ways that you hold them accountable to that? I know you mentioned like the disappointed dad, which I think is a, is a great point. And you mentioned like getting after players, I guess, you know, you have probably learned that through your experience. So especially for younger coaches or coaches just walking into a head coaching room and understanding how to really read the room like that. Do you have any advice for those guys? Yeah, it's tough. You know, it just depends on your athletic department and, you know, the, the support staff from a standpoint of, you know, our weight room, you know, uh, our, our, our head strength and conditioning coach has certain, you know, standards and rules. And if you're late and we, we've got to kind of figure out how is it, what's the most effective way to get these guys to understand, you know, our basic standard. And that, that's something that I always continue to push is, is we are what we allow and what is our standard. And so um, as you deal with different individual infractions, obviously, um, anything with the university, you know, as far as alcohol uh, infractions, they have usually things in place. And so the biggest thing that I've learned over the years, especially now that we can't use the feet as much, um, because I think that's just how our athletic department here, you know, is, we can't sit there and have our normal dawn patrols that Coach Brownlee uh, is famous for here is your 6 a.m. kind of runs. If, you know, you do something that, that crosses the line and uh, like I said, the feet are usually the best way to get to the brain, just like the, you know, the benches, you know, bench to the butts, the best way to get to the brain on, you know, having better practices for players that aren't playing, you know, just getting them to understand. I, I think those are going by the wayside. So if you start to look at it, what's the most important thing in these kids' life? Um, you know, obviously, as a student athlete, you look at their academics, they have a plan, they, they're focused on getting schoolwork done, but you know, what is their best joy? They got here for a reason. So now you're starting to talk about baseball. And I, I think that's the only way to really get kids to understand and hit home is, is take baseball away from them. Um, you know, and, and yes, it might hurt their overall development, but, you know, 
if we have a couple infractions of guys, you know, oversleeping and not, you know, not going to wait um, or showing up to practice late, you know, they just, they don't need to practice for a couple of days and they get some time to think and understand. And, 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 and then also, so that that's kind of one area that, that you can look at, but I think hands down the best overall area is just to somehow get a full team accountability of it. And that's kind of depending on what your leadership is and how, you know, your, your relationships are from the standpoint of we're all in this together type of deal. If one of us kind of make a mistake, we all need to kind of handle that mistake. And so uh, there's a lot of different techniques that can, you can do. Um, but, you know, you obviously don't want to single and embarrass people out. So you want to kind of have a full team type of activity or, you know, conversation about what's detrimental to our standard. Because if you have real true upperclassmen leadership or just overall leadership, they're also going to police themselves. And I think that's that's been unique through my time is, is my best teams that I have, they have policed themselves. They have already had the discussions. They've already had, you know, the, the breakdown of, you know, of accountability for one another as well. And, and so I think there's not, but the new age kind of way that athletic departments are going, it's very challenging to do any type of physical activity. Um, and that's fine. I mean, that's just the way it is. But now we start focusing on taking baseball away. Um, and, and so if you take baseball away or if you get a full team kind of accountability, um, I think I think that's how you can. And that, like I said, I go back. That's the hands down. The worst part of our job is being consistent with discipline and finding different ways to communicate the discipline uh, as a leader and as a head coach. I'm telling you, we can go through all these questions and look at them. The toughest thing that each each guy has to do is handle disciplinary actions, um, especially when it's when it's um, you know how you do little things is how you do everything, no doubt. But it's even the little things as far as just being late for late. You have to be on top of to make sure you're consistent with, no matter if you're three hole or the last player on your roster. You know, but uh, as far as, you know, more serious matters, athletic department has, you know, every athletic department has different rules and regulations and, and things in place with university as far as drug infractions, uh, alcohol infractions, um, you know, driving incidents and things like that. So a lot of that takes care of itself. But you're looking at, you know, what you're trying to hold accountable for all your student athletes up to our standard. And our, one of our just basic standards is, is always be on time. And so that's that's one thing that really uh, bothers me is whenever you're wasting other people's time by not being there, um, because it's time is you can't get back. And so I, that that's kind of one of the standards of what we will allow. And so um, it's always, you know, you can use the disappointed dad, you can use the sternness, but if you got true leadership, they're going to hopefully hold them accountable because that's that is going to handle it more than anything. Because as a student athlete, as a baseball player being a part of, part of something bigger than yourself as the number one thing you want to be is you want to be a guy 10 15 20 years from now you're labeled as a good teammate and you will always remember your good teammates and you will always remember your bad teammates and i think that's something that that that'll really hit home and and so those are things that we just try to push to the overall standard here uh, in the baseball program no, again, I love hearing that. And, and for the listeners, again, this is coming from a coach who's at the Division One level. And so getting to hear uh, a good teammate, I mean, obviously that works no matter what level that you're on because you hear that in the big leagues. You hear guys who who make their make players around them better all the way down to, you know, the amateur levels, youth leagues, all of that stuff. So it's one of the things that is in our control, which I, I, I love getting to hear you say that. But let's talk about holding them to that standard. So, uh, and I think this also goes into the environment that you set up every day and culture. And so, let's just talk about like what is what is the culture at Evansville? What are you trying to promote every single day? What are some ways that you do things like that? And like, whenever if we were a prospective recruit or we were coming to campus, what would we see and feel? And what it, what are you very intentional about as just as far as culture goes? You feel family first and foremost. Um, we're a very small private school where, you know, our athletic department is 
up to 20% of our student body, wrap your head around that. And we only have, you know, we don't have that many student athletes. We have 300. So what we have here, first and foremost, is, is our team camaraderie, team chemistry, and family type of feel. Um, you know, it's not a big, you know, party school, but we have a lot of baseball houses that our guys really, uh, obviously with COVID this year, it's, it's a little different. But uh, over the years, is our guys really bond and get together a significant amount at the baseball house and, and really develop those relationships off the field. And we really try to push for our upperclassmen, you know, to integrate with our, you know, freshmen, sophomores, get them out of the dorms and get to know them. And, and, and that's just a big part of overall team building. Obviously, we'll try to do, uh, you know, team dinners around holidays. Uh, where we'll get them. I like I like for players to see me in different environments around my family, my assistant coaches, girlfriends, wives, for them to see us as as human beings and and different type of role players. Um, especially as my kids are getting a little older, my son's coming around a little more out onto the field, and uh, so that's really unique and special for players to see me interact. You know, not as the you know, not as the head coach, but as a as a, a leader of, of of a family as well. And so, just being able to have that type of interaction that we're all in this together. Um, there's no divide up between the coaching staff and the players. I think it's something that we good the good teams that I've had here. We've had that feel where we've had guys in the locker room that have had uh, assistant coaches, the pitching coaches back, the head coaches back for a lineup, for a pitching change call. All those things, understanding that we are in it together. And that comes down to overall, you know, basic relationships that I tried to work hard on uh, more and more throughout the years to be able to have. Um, because as a player, I take myself back as a player, I was a um, I was a pleaser. I wanted to please Coach Brownlee. And I fought like heck in order to hear him say, attaboy, Carol. And so there's not a lot of pleaser players anymore because they've a lot of things have been done for them. And so I've kind of, you know, early on, I was that standoff coach, ready for, ready for players to please me and things like that. Whereas, no, you know, it, it's about their individual career path, being a part, you know, of something bigger than ourselves here at U of E. And so getting them bought into the ACES script across their chest um, and understanding that, you know, you want to leave this place better than, than when you came in. And so it, it's tricky because now you've got the transfer portal and you've got uh, travel baseball have kind of changed the dynamics of how people look at things. And so, and what I mean by that is, is that, you know, these kids now that are, that are coming through, college baseball is is that eight nine ten eleven twelve years old if their parents don't like them in the three hole starting shortstop they're able to find another travel ball team that they can be shortstop in the three hole and so when we get kids on the campus if they come in as freshmen and don't you know play right away and things like that it is easy the easy thing to do now is to just go try to find you know what i mean the, the better fit and i mean you're seeing some players that are going on three to four different places now you know, through their college career. And we try to eliminate that. We try to create as good a retention as we possibly can here so that they can develop in our system. And because we are, we go after high school players more than junior college players. And so, you know, that, that's something that you're always battling and fighting and, and you can't have good team chemistry and team camaraderie if you're bringing in, you know, 15 players new each and every year. You want these guys to grow together through the course of three or four years. And that's why at the University of Evansville and a lot of private schools, you'll see cycles. You'll see, you know, making a run at the top of your conference every three to four years. And it's very challenging to have sustainable success each year because uh, that, that's just kind of the, the nature of the beast of being at a private school. So uh, that's what we, we, we try to build here um, through a significant amount of community service hours um, is something that the University of Evansville Athletic Department has always been special with. I love it. I love the fact that our guys feel like getting out there and giving to the community, being visible in the community with Habitat for Humanity um, and many other different organizations. I think they can learn a significant amount about giving instead of taking. And so I think they, you know, just being around each other as much as possible is, is unique. And we also have a, a culture of our guys, you know, 
hovering around our field. We were very fortunate to just get a new, um, you know, facility upgrade. And it's been a shot of adrenaline and a morale booster for everybody involved. And, and our guys want to be out there at the field. They want to hang out and be around. And, and so I think that's something that's unique and special going on with our culture right now as well. No, really, really cool. So, uh, congrats on the new upgrade, by the way. I think that that's, that's always a, a, a boost of energy whenever you guys, uh, or whenever anyone gets a facility upgrade, that's really cool with, uh, so let's, let's rewind back to August in a normal year <laughs> and, uh, let's just go ahead. Hopefully we'll never have to deal with COVID issues again. Uh, and then we could go back to just regular, like we can actually spend time together in the fall. But I'd love to love for you to walk us through just a a calendar of program development starting whenever they get on campus. So really, main and and main idea is like what are the pillars that you try and hit uh, throughout a, a year of player development? So they get to campus in August or September whenever they do, and what are some things that we hit? And then we'll just kind of roll through uh, through the season if, if you if you don't mind taking us through it. Absolutely, and and the NCAA obviously regulates you know, the, the amount of hours and, you know, non-championship season. And so being able to have, you know, individuals, your full team practice weeks and your individuals on the back of that before you go into Thanksgiving, honestly, each and every year kind of dictates on the, the position of where a majority of our arms are. Um, we've had years where we felt like we needed to send a lot of our pitchers out into summer baseball. And so with that, if we have a lot of our arms that are in different places that need to rest and shut down, we might move our fall schedule back a little bit. So a lot of it dictates on trying to figure out what's the best way to develop our pitching, our pitching staff, uh, and to put them in position so that they're ready to go come January. Because the most frightening part of the entire calendar for a baseball coaching staff at the college level is that four to five week area over Christmas break where we don't have eyeballs on them and physical contact, and especially with our pitchers as they ramp up for the college baseball season. Here we are starting a college baseball season on the third week of February, and we didn't start school till January 20th this semester. So that is such a small window to try to ramp up guys. And so it's very challenging um, to hold our guys accountable and have structure for them through the month of December and January especially when some of these guys like this past year with COVID didn't have a lot of facilities to be able to go and work out at. So with that being the most frightening part of the year, you really want to structure your fall schedule to help prepare them for that ramp up stage. And so, you know, some years we have gone later in the fall, some years we've gone earlier in the fall with our championship schedule, but it's usually a combination of, weeks of individuals, which is small group workouts that we're developing and teaching our basic fundamentals of um, our hands and feet from a position player standpoint. Uh, you know, usually the individuals before our non-championship full practice schedule, we're not doing a lot of swing change, especially to our new players. We want to see them perform. They're here for a reason. We want to see them perform through the course of, you know, all inner squads and full team practice. And then if we have individuals on the back end of that, in November is usually when we can identify breakdown video and really go through some uh, swing change uh, that needs to happen for them. We feel like to be in a better place to be successful. And so, so going back to them getting on campus, uh, we do some certain activities. We love opposite hand dodgeball. Uh, we like to try to break the ice with a lot of guys. I really encourage them getting together uh, both on and off the field on their own. Um, and that's really, comes down to a lot of our, you know, our leaders and, and not just our seniors, but leaders that are in your sophomore, junior classes as well, that can really try to bring the most out of, you know, those new guys in the program, kind of break the ice and get them comfortable and confident when they come to the yard. And so uh, those are things that we just kind of try to steer or try to focus on early. And then we, we get into a full flesh plan. I mean, I think you have to have a pitching coach that uh, have a full mapped out detailed plan of what's expected out of our pitching staff. You have to have a hitting coach that has a full detailed type of plan as far as what's expected in our certain drills that we do. 
um, and being prepared for those drills and an expectation of how we go about performing um, during practice, during individuals. Uh, and then most importantly in the weight room as well as we transition to after our non-championship schedule, that's where we try to really gain have, have gains in the weight room as well. So it's all encompassing. And, and it, it, it's, it's very challenging for new student athletes to kind of adjust to that overall calendar and plan. So you've got to work with them and ease them into everything, especially with the heavy new workload that they're experiencing in the classroom as well. So I'm, I'm just happy we are a sport, unlike soccer's, that we have a semester to kind of settle into being a student athlete. There's a lot of those fall sports that have a tough time where all those new players come in at, at the end of the summer and it's just game on. And it's very challenging. So as a baseball program, you know, as a baseball uh, sport, we're able to have that fall semester to really get all of our new guys to get comfortable with the overall uh, student athlete schedule. So if you look at it, we'll have uh, a couple weeks of individuals. We'll have, you know, a 45 day window for our non championship practice schedule. Uh, through that, we're we're having full team practice uh, for uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we usually have inner squats Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just depending on where our arms are at. Um, with Mondays are our mandatory days off, and so you kind of get in that r rhythm and routine. We've been very fortunate that NCAA over the last couple of years has allowed us to start playing some games. We're allowed to play two games in the fall, and we take full advantage of that. And so uh, we did that, I think, back to back years. And that was that was just outstanding to be able to play somebody in a different uniform uh, is so uh, crucial. It, it truly is to kind of see how people perform. And then uh, then we transition to, you know, our, our individuals where we kind of get into our overall, you know, defensive work uh, where it's a certain amount of hours throughout the course of the week. So we kind of map it out. We're very fortunate to have a full turf infield now, our full turf baseball field now and also an indoor 12,000 square foot uh, remodeled facility as well that's just one big cage so we have the space to be able to you know develop and work with our players and what I love about it is our players have access to these facilities 24 hours a day seven days a week to get work in on their own and that's what it takes I think honing your craft in the game of baseball takes work outside of practice as well and we have a great culture of our guys doing that and then as we send them off into, you know, Thanksgiving, uh, it just depends on kind of how everybody's university calendar lands. Uh, you know, as we transition into finals, we want to make sure that they have a plan for whenever they go home. Uh, individual defense or individual offensive plan, uh, just an overall, you know, seven day pitching program plan um, of what they need to, you know, work on whenever they're at home. Uh, we, we, we try to make sure each and every guy is set up with some sort of space facility to be able to execute uh, all of those as well. And then um, then it's just, you know, trying to weekly, you know, touch base with them, making sure that they're staying on top of it. And I think we're close on technology. As I talked about how uh, the scariest moment of the year is that month of December and January, as far as just making sure our pitchers, you know, are up to speed. I feel like technology is getting closer and closer on ways that we're able to monitor their workload on their elbow and shoulders, you know, with, with a lot of new technology and sleeves that, you know, these pitchers can do and, and the data collecting and accountability that I think we can do um, uh, that I'm really excited to kind of dive into over the next couple of years. Because like I said, that's such a crucial part of the year. And you could tell the guys that don't put in the work and you could tell the guys that do put in the work however you usually can't tell until you're deep into the season you know uh, you can't tell until you're you know four or five outings into the season with really you know how their stamina is how their arm is usually the aches and pains you know and that is all the foundation of being built on their own in December and January as they get ready for the season now, I've heard that from a, a lot of different college coaches of where they're like, that two weeks is the most stressful time during our entire year, just making sure that, you know, that they come back ready and come back healthy and come back, you know, mentally ready to go to. And so uh, you get them back from uh, you get them back from Christmas break. They got, you know, two or three weeks off and then you guys start your uh, your preseason stuff. So 
besides getting pitchers ready, which you guys have been doing, uh, as you mentioned with your very detailed plan, what are like, as a head coach perspective, what are like the, uh, things that you, that you just, you go over with your staff of, Hey, we've got to do these to make sure we're ready for game one. Do you have like, like a checklist or is it more fluid based on the team, which it may be both of those things, but I'd love to hear your thought process on how we can win the preseason and, and how you've done so, uh, in, you know, and, and adjusted your plan over the last couple of years. Absolutely. I think the most crucial part is, is weather dictates so much uh, in the game of baseball. And the more you can get outside, the better. Uh, the years, you know, with a natural playing surface, you know, some of our first round balls was opening weekend. And we were not set up for success in any way, shape or form when that's the position that you're in. So you've got to try to find ways to make the most out of it. We had an indoor facility before it was remodeled that we tried, uh, you know, everything possible from doing inner squads, doing full uh, live ground balls in there. And it's very, very challenging. And so you've got to try to find a way to get as much, you know, live at bats as you possibly can in game-like settings. And so that's why I've been so excited with this season so far. Our first full year of having the turf is the month of January. We were outside a significant amount. And it really put us in a position to be ready for opening weekend. And so um, understanding is, is that if you can't, if you don't have that opportunity, then you need to take full advantage of whenever you go down and, and play in those weekends and play south is, is make sure you can get full practices in on Thursday uh, whenever you're going to places. Make sure that you take full advantage of your I.O. time and your batting practice time. I remember a couple of years when we do our, our action BP, which is my favorite drill, um, we would do that as batting practice uh, early on if we couldn't get out on our field, uh, you know, before the season. And so uh, I know you consider and make a lot of excuses for not being prepared for the season, but you also got to push through that and find ways uh, to prepare your team mentally and physically you know, uh, for, for, for the college baseball schedule. And so, because nobody's, one of my favorite sayings is, is nobody feels sorry for you when you suck. So you, you got to get through that and you got to understand how to perform, uh, and get your team prepared the best way they possibly can. And, and so it's a, it's a challenging grind for it. A lot of other Northern schools. Um, but like I said, I feel like we're really turning the corner on getting prepared for opening weekends. We are also starting now to open second weekend of the year, which is enormous uh, because our temperature is always pretty is, is good enough. But um, so so just getting from a standpoint of, you know, trying to fight through those excuses and that feeling of being stale, being indoors, being in a gymnasium cage or whatnot, um, you still got to work on getting uh, bat to ball skills going and getting your pitchers pitching uh, to, you know, live human beings uh, instead of into uh, just regular bullpens. And then as a coaching staff, I feel like the number one thing that we have to do is, is through that preseason is, is identifying roles and then start finding ways through your relationship building to communicate those roles. And as you start to communicate those roles, and if you can communicate those roles the right way, they will buy into the roles. And so the most challenging thing, you know, you have to do is, is to convince a kid to buy into being a fourth outfielder, convince a, a former starter into being a role player out of the bullpen, you know, and, and, and trying to get them to understand how crucial and key it is to the success of our team. Um, we are currently going through that like everybody is each and every year. Last weekend, we had, you know, three unbelievable long re relief outings that led to us winning a three out of four series. And those three long relief guys have been starters in the years past. They've been starters their whole life. And for them to accept that role put us in a position to win. And I think if you start getting them to understand how they can be so impactful and, and get away from the cloud of I've got to be the starter or, you know, uh, I've got to be the starting shortstop, whereas, hey, I just moved you over to second base and your athleticism, your skill set have put us in a better position of success. Like uh, being able to have those relationships to communicate and have those tough decisions 
or uh, tough stuff, tough conversations will put them into a position of buying in. And if you've got a team full of guys buying in to the ACE script across your chest and, and putting their own individual accolades aside, success will follow not only the team, but them as well. And, and so I think that's so crucial. And we are wrong as well as head coaches and as assistant coaches, as coaching staffs. Identifying roles doesn't just happen in January, February. You've got to continue to you know, identify. You've got to continue to adapt and adjust, have those conversations with the building relationships to, uh, to pivot. Um, and that's what I think you have to do and, and, and communicate. You can't just let lost people just keep getting lost and you've got to stay in contact with them. You've got to stay in developing them. You got to see, keep honing their, their craft and their skills through the course of the season. And so I think that's really, um, and, and our pitching coaches, you know, that you put a lot on them to really do the identifying because they are with them for every single pitch, every single bullpen. And they, you know, have the skill set to know what roles matter. And so, uh, cause every role matters in college baseball. If you look at this year, uh, four game weekends. Holy smokes! I mean, the, the ha- you have to have a managed bullpen and workload, uh, especially if you're playing one on Friday, two on Saturday, one on Sunday. It is so essential and key to have guys that can bounce back and and put them in certain roles to piggyback off of other starters. And so, uh, they if they can just buy in and understand that we are putting them in the best position to be successful, then they will ultimately buy into it as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So uh, this is something that we can all get better at because it's not an easy conversation to have because I, I think if, if we could, we'd have like 12 guys and they would all play all the time and we would be really good and no one would ever have any problems. But explain to me, like say I'm the fourth outfielder and three really good guys in front of me. How, what are some ways or just some some just let's have a conversation about it if you don't mind because I'd love to hear just how you explain it in a way that is number one productive for the player, but also getting them to buy in to be productive for the team as well. Well, yeah, the thing is, is that I don't have a set, you know, nine that play all the time. Um, I'll tell you what the new technology that we have out there, uh, having a plan and understanding, you know, we can sit there and watch starting pitchers. We can sit there and watch relief pitchers. We can get a real feel for uh, all their off speed, how their fastball works. And it's our job of coaches is to put our best play, our players in positions to have success. So I know um, this type of swing path, this guy rotates down really good. He's going to be able to get his hands inside the slider uh, that, that he's going to see in these types of counts. And, and so you can kind of mix and match. However, we have staples in our lineup, no doubt about it. You have your staple guys. Um, but also you got to ride the hot hand in a lot of areas as well. And so uh, get, and that's just you knowing your players. That's just you really grasping and understanding and knowing your players, knowing, all right, this guy, you know, he's hot right now. I've seen him, you know, he's a hot, cold type of guy or he's a consistent guy and you kind of ride a uh, different type of waves. So it's just about trying to match up. And that's something that we didn't have back in the day. We did not have any type of split stats. We didn't have any kind of feel for that. We were just going off of what a batting average against was, walks the innings pitch. And so it was tough to kind of get a feel for all that until you got to the game you saw with your eyes. And you're like, oh, man, like I, I made a bad decision in the lineup there. However, communicating with it is just knowing that it's coming from the betterment of being a part of something bigger than yourself. Understanding that, you know, the program is bigger than – than you getting these three at bats and and also understanding is is that 10 15 20 years from now you might be the only one that knows you know what you did against south dakota state on friday april 2nd and you're barely going to remember that but what you're going to remember is 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 your teammates what you guys did as a whole how fun it was to sit here and run and sprint on a walk off throwing a you know Heck, I'm seeing ECU wearing a, a cone on his head, running around the field. College baseball is exciting and fun. And you are a part of something really cool and special as you navigate through a college baseball season. It is hands down one of the most, one of the most amazing experiences that as these individuals are going to go through. 
And so understanding that, you know, the role that you need to play in this special journey, you know, is this type of area. And this is why you're going to excel at it. I am going to put you in the best positions to be successful. If I have you, if you're a fourth outfielder, but I have you in the lineup every day, this type of pitcher is going to expose you. And these are the weaknesses that we need to work on to get better at and show consistency in. And if, you know, those are the areas that, that you've got to have some hard conversations, but us in this position uh, have to identify those roles and be able to talk to them. Um, because if you're direct and you talk to them and get them to understand that, hey, if, I have, if I'm rolling you in there every day and, and we're facing these two lefties, you know, these are the things, part of your swing path that we got to work on, or this is your approach that needs to change. Let's work on these things. Let's, and that's what we do in practice. But in game, you know, I, I'm going to put you in position so that whenever you are in the game, know that, hey, I know you can have success right here, right now. And your team needs you to. So I think that's how, if you could get them to understand that these decisions are coming from first and foremost being fair, but also from our knowledge of, of knowing what success you can have, I think is really crucial and critical. Um, but you have to have depth in order to do that. And this year is kind of unique because we have all the COVID seniors back and everything. And so a lot of times I have small rosters. So the lineup kind of plays out for itself. So, uh, but anyways, hopefully that kind of answered that question for you. Oh, definitely. And the more I, again, I, I, speaking of my very, very limited and lack of experience as a head coach, I would call, you know, the, that's one of those things It's called crucial conversations. It's like you're a head coach and you do like 90% of your job as an administrator and, uh, having those conversations just to guide the program in a direction that you want it to go. Like you mentioned, you, you've got such great assistance that I think I, I just I, I can't overstate enough how important that is. The more that I study really, really, really good coaches, they have those conversations they are really good at it and they're really good at not necessarily motivating because I think that that can be a temporary thing, but inspiring guys to take on those roles. And that's when your teams are really good. And I, I love hearing that from you. And, you know, another thing that, that I think it takes a lot of, of practice and time to do is to gain a feel of what to do in season because you're like, well, we just lifted yesterday and we've got this guy this weekend and this guy's hurt and this guy's playing and this guy's thrown a thousand innings in the last two days. And, and just so gaining a feel of when to push, when to pull and all of those things in season. And again, you've got, you've had a, a lot of years of experience and, and you're still young on that. But I would love to hear just your advice for head coaches or even just coaches in general of, of gaining and, and feeling and reading the room on when to push, when to pull, uh, when to do this or that during the season. Because it's like we have to set the we set the schedule, like you mentioned, be to be Uber, writing down all the different things that you want to be do that you want to do. But at the same time, you have to be able to have the ability to adjust. So. I'm sure it's a it's a <laughs> it's a battle that you're fighting almost every day in your mind of is this the right thing or is it not and and I'm kind of doing that myself while I'm rambling here but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, and I think this year, you know, is so drastically different with and compared to years in the past where we only have one midweek game this year. <clears throat> However, it brings a lot of challenges. There's so many positives and negatives to both kind of schedules. A couple of years ago, you played a 56 game schedule over 14 weeks where you had three game weekends and then you had one to up to two midweeks. And so with that, it is very challenging, especially if you don't have the, the weather or facilities going into the season where all you're doing is playing games. And so the pros and cons of that are is it's very good for your pitching staff to be able to develop a lot of young talent where they can get out on the rubber on Tuesday or Tuesday and Wednesday to be able to perform right against, you know, opponents. So development of pitching staff, I think is real interesting when it comes to how you have midweek games. However, from a position player, player standpoint, it's very challenging. It is. And as a full team, when you're looking at team defense and aspects, team base running and, and offensive situational hitting and, just overall development, 
this year has been glorious so far from the standpoint of we've been able to have some full team real practices Tuesday, Wednesday, where we've been able to pump the brakes on Thursday, get ready for a four game weekend. And it is, couldn't come at a per, more perfect time with a lot of young players that we have in our program to have the type of fall practice schedule where we can really push the limits and push them uh, through certain drills and their development. We're able to have fall practices in the spring now. And I think it's really paying off because we do drills that are trying to be as game-like as possible, but it's all about reps. And and one of my favorite drills is, is it's called Action BP, and everybody has their own version of Action BP. Um, I got this off of, you know, an Arizona video, a TCU video, Iowa Western, uh, Reaver BP. You know, it's really unique and special where you can have a significant am amount of reps from an offensive standpoint with a certain mindset that they have um, of situational hitting, of gap-to-gap -gap approach, 2K approach. But whatever position that we put our hitters in, then our defense can kind of feed off of it as well. We get a significant amount of double play balls. Uh, we're playing everything live off the bat. Our outfielders on live, we're going through cutoffs and relays where we're having base runners, which leads me to our base runners who are getting great reads at first, second, and third. And I think it's a staple in our program. Our action BP can really hit all three facets of the game from an uh, offensive and defensive standpoint that – it's tiring, it wears them out, and it's awesome to be able to have it in season because of not having midweek games. And so, uh, you know, but as you're in season, so I take myself a couple of years back in season, it's all about trying to take care of their arms and legs because we do continue to lift in season. I think it's very valuable as a former professional player you know, you've got to continue to uh, maintain the gains that you had through the off season. So we, we still lift and work out. And I know that's very taxing on somebody that plays three games over a weekend, especially our catchers, and they're going to lift two to three times a week. I know if I have midweek games, I can't sit here and do action BP. I can't do a, a real base running type of thing because of their legs. So now it comes back to trying to work on the mind, having feel good BPs, having feel good type of fungos. And then you incorporate action as much as you can. You incorporate game like as much as you can, where you're working on focusing on bunning, focusing on, you know, footwork more. But uh, so, so those are things that have been interesting this year that, um, you know, going into next year, trying to have that balance to be able to continue to develop, um, uh, because when you're playing all these midweeks, you know, you've got a set of guys that aren't getting a significant amount of playing time. And all they're getting is, you know, batting practice if they're traveling, you know, and, and you lose, you, you disconnect from them. Unfortunately, it's tough because you don't see them every day. They're not on travel rosters. You know, they're, they're back at home. They, they don't go with you over the weekend. I mean, there's a chance I, I don't see a kid, but two days out of the week, if we have a midweek and we're, we're leaving to go on a trip. It's tough to develop those kids. So this year has been really special and unique where that, that kid has been able to, he's coming off an injury or something, has been able to participate and be a part of it. So anyways, I know that's kind of a, a long-winded answer to that, but um, you're exactly right. Being able to push the gas and pump the brakes on their legs, their arm, and their mind is, is ultimately motivational timing and just overall a feel that, you know, head coaches have that, that they usually follow up with success afterwards and your teams play uh, in a better way. Oh, great answer. I love it. Never, never long winded when you, when you answer a, a question so well, especially since my, I think my question took you, took longer than, than you actually took to answer it. So that's probably me that was rambling, but uh, I, I can also hear a lot of guys typing right now, trying to get a, a, an action BP plan from you because I, I thought that that was a, that was a really cool thing too. Uh, but I do. So I, I've got some, some quick hitters for you. And, uh, and so before you go, I would love to hear just, and this is lightning section, just, you know, you, you can go as in depth as you want, but I'm, I'm probably not going to be going back and forth. I just want to hear your thoughts on it, but what's something that you've, you've learned or that you've dug into lately. That's, that's gotten you really excited or that you learned from data. 
I, I think just new age data. Um, I was an old school guy coming in, you know, we're going to hard nineties, get on and off the field, like just play hard. You know, I feel like I had some certain swing stuff that we want to do footwork stuff, but now as a head coach, I'm starting to dive into more data. It's fascinating what track man wraps it um, uh, and just, all the different type of RE24, run expects to see 24 graphs, charts as we transition and make that transition from professional baseball, all the data from professional, how is it, you know, incorporate into college baseball. Um, so uh, I think that's something that's significant. I mean, what Synergy is providing for college baseball is, is miraculous and, and for the preparation because you have to prepare and and I think it's just really, really fascinating the amount of data collection that you can dive into and understand and process. And then you can use it as tools to help develop your players or put them in positions of success. Um, but also like what you're seeing from the track man thing as far as injury prevention, being able to recognize and understand where the pitchers, you know, you could see how the pitcher's arm slot release point, things are adjusting and, and is he starting to favor his you know, shoulder, his elbow. And really, you know, bringing coach A.J. Gora into the pitching coach role, you know, his, his experience at Mississippi State with the track man, I understand that. And then Kirsch Kimball over from UK, who's a grad assistant there for a couple of years, had track man. Just having them really open my eyes is something that we're going to try to push for here at U of E because the data can really show uh, from an injury prevention standpoint, but also from new age teaching. These kids are so visual now. And so having more visual and, and getting more video with data can really, I think, grow the mind and, and overall player um, that we're dealing with at 18 to 22 years old. Love it. What is something that you have changed your mind about that you used to do, but you don't do anymore? Data. <laughs> no, data, just overall saber metrics uh, of it, you know, like just really diving into and understanding, you know, um, you know, what matters, what matters when in offensive statistics, what matters in pitching statistics, um, you know, instead of just using your eyeballs, uh, you know, the, the collection of data to understand that, you know, the batting average is the most evil thing in the game of baseball. You know, we need to focus on on-base percentage, slugging percentage, and your overall quality trip to the dish as far as when you walk back to the dugout or you're at bats over your RE24 number. I mean, are you producing the offense? Are you helping move the offense forward in a, in a standpoint of helping us score runs? And so um, looking at little things like that, I've changed uh, you know, my mind about a little bit as far as being stubborn with utilizing the, the new age, the new age things. So, and there's still some give and take with it. You know, I think, you, you know, you're, you're starting to see a lot of the spin rates come, come out and it's fantastic. It's great. And I think it can help in a lot of the recruiting and understanding, but also understanding the personality, um, is so crucial and important in the recruiting part of it, but also the personality to be able to connect so that you can have those crucial, like you say, conversations, and you can have those genuine developmental moments when you're given constructive criticism, just as well as them being able to be there to understand when you're lifting them up and giving them good, good, you know, kind of mojo and good feeling as well. So the, it's that give and take of, of having that balance that makes sense. No doubt. I love that. Love hearing that. What is one drill or a couple of drills that your players love that we can steal from you? Yeah. Overall team, uh, team drills that uh, we do that coach Gore kind of brought in. That I really like, it's just a high energy upbeat, um, inside game. It's where we have our PFP involved, uh, our pitchers fielding practice involved with our catchers, third baseman, short second, first baseman, our entire infield where, We'll have pitchers out there uh, where we have a set kind of routine. We have a set routine where, um, you know, we're throwing around the bag. Every Everybody's moving. And I just, I really like it. It's something that I can share with you. Uh, I'll try to get a graphic for you and, and an overall breakdown. But it's like just a, a numbers thing where if it's a 3-1, you know, get over type of situation. Where if it's a comeback or 1-6-3 double play, it's a 2-6-3 double play. 
you know, and it's the, the four hole tough throw to the, to the pitcher covering the bag. So it's a main, you know, pitcher's fielding practice, but we have slow rollers incorporated and the entire team is incorporated, but most importantly, the energy that it has uh, is so special and unique. And we start out a lot of our practices with it. And, and so uh, I, I think it's, I, I like one of those type of drills, but also then I like um, what we have from a defensive standpoint where I call it pressure D, pressure defense, because I want my fielders to get their sequence of their footwork and where, when they break their hands, a feel of the game. So what I'll do is my, my poor outfielders run a lot in a lot of our team defense drills, but I'll put them about eight to 10 feet down the line and, and whatever ground ball I hit with the fungo or off of front toss, guy takes off and usually it's going to be, you know, two or three, two, one steps to the bag with our outfielder. So when the ball kind of hits the glove and it forces our infielders to, you know, either hurry up and speed up the play or they get an overall feel for the time that they have and the sequence of breaking the hands with uh, the separation of the feet or the, the replacement step of the feet. And so I, I just like that staple uh, in our program. Also, we've gotten into shifts where we kind of set up and make sure that we, we're in right, uh, straight up, right slight pull, right heavy pull, same thing with the lefties and just kind of having our basic. And that's what we do early on is just knowing and understanding where our spacing needs to be on the infield. Um, and so those, those are a couple of drills there. Uh, most importantly, you know, I, I just, I, I love the action BP of it all. I think it incorporates everything. Um, and, and so it gets all facets of the games going. And so, uh, and then with the turf field that we have, we have a good amount of space that we have is, is we'll do Oriental BP. Uh, I, I'm sure you've seen a lot of Japanese practice. It's, it's absolutely amazing what they're able to do as far as we'll set the turtle and another stage up and we'll hit, have two guys hitting at the same time. Um, I think it's really uh, unique and special. So we'll get a, a lot of cuts in with that. And uh, we'll, we'll use some hack attack from time to time. We'll use overhand. So it's just a mixture of that. So there's some parts of our practice that guys have structure and understand. And then there's some randomness to it. And you always try to bring in the randomness because that's when the brain can process and, and, and kind of work through different things. The action BP, there's a significant amount of randomness that your middle infield and your outfielders have to perform. And that's so crucial and important, especially when your outfielders are trying to keep double plays intact. And so I think that's, that's hands down the number one, uh, you know, brain kind of process for our outfielders is to understand they always have to keep the double play intact. And, and you can only create those situations live in game or through action BP. You, it's so tough to have a standard structure drill for our guys not to, not to make it too easy of a decision. You want to try to create as tough a decision as possible for our outfielders. And so uh, that's why I like action BP. So those are a couple of our drills that we do and, and really like. Nice. And then finally, what is a book or just something that you would recommend uh, that you've really liked that uh, that if our coaches are looking to get something new to read or a course to take, what is something that you would recommend? Well, I, I truly hope this isn't something new to read. I mean, baseball can get, as I've talked about data and I've talked about a lot of new age things, baseball is still simple. It's still a simple game. And I think the simplest book that has ever been written about the game of baseball that I still go back to is the mental game of baseball by Dorfman. And, and, and I think it's cool, a cool man. Anyways, those two guys, what they process, just the basic great adjectives of the mind from uh, confidence, attitude, focus, you know, don't get away from the basics of just trying to find, you know, ultimate confidence and competing in this game. I'm telling you, you can sit here and go read all the new age type of books and they're all fantastic. But I always go back to this one. It's just so simple and it's a way to get clarity and, and build, have the stepping stones to success through it. And so uh, it's truly a remarkable book. And then for me, um, kind of born in a pessimistic kind of like, you know, worst case scenario type of guy. And, and part of being a head coach, you have to, you know, have that type of worst case scenario. So you're prepared 
for whatever kind of comes as you're looking at things ahead. However, it can also really get down uh, an aspect of and that positive type of overall approach. John Gordon, anything that that guy puts pen to paper is simple and gold uh, to me. They're always easy reads. He's got a new book out, Stick Together, that I can't wait to dive into. Um, so I know that might sound corny, but I, I think you need to have just that ultimate positive type of mindset. And, and it's tough. It's tough as coaches because every day we are putting out so many fires and our, our, our positivity is getting, you know, our armor is just getting hammered on. And so it's so tough to not just fall into that pessimistic, you know, mentality of woe is me. Um, you know, especially if, if whatever challenges that you're at, but I'm telling you, if you could sit there and have that type of, uh, positive attitude each and every day and let the little things start to slide off, um, you can have a significant amount of success. And that's how I have evolved uh, as much as I possibly can is, is I used to let every little detail just really, it wouldn't just put a chink in my armor. It would knock off a significant amount of my armor and how I wore that every day. And so it's something that I've really tried to work on. And I think John Gordon um, uh, is, is pretty simple and remarkable of how focused it is on just, you have a choice. And so if I can recommend anything, it would be the mental game of baseball, which I think is the ultimate building block of uh, how the mind should work, especially as a position player. Um, but then they also have the, the mental games of pitching as well. And then any anything John Gordon writes uh, is, is gold in my book. And and so it's really it's helped me throughout throughout my ways. And I'm always I'm always digging to try to find great podcasts out there. Um, great books. My brother is a wonderful mentor to me to be able to share so many great positive messages um, because I mean, that, that is about the, the most mentally strong individual I've ever been around. And his story is truly remarkable. And, and so I try to feed off of him on, on a lot of that. Well, Wes, I, let me be the first to tell you, man, I, I appreciate your insight. I appreciate you just really giving us a great look inside what uh, playing at Evansville would look and feel like and just an entire year of, of really deliberate and organized uh, practice and, and what you're talking about. Uh, but I do, uh, again, I want to say thank you for that. But I do want to give you the opportunity to just talk to our guests and just anything else that you want to tell them or you want to talk about or anything else that we neglected. I'm just kind of going to mute myself and then let you roll. But anything else that you'd like to cover or, or tell them before you go? Yeah, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, obviously, uh, Jamie had a great experience uh, discussing, you know, his his vision and, and a lot of things that he has to do in the game of baseball. And, and you know, what I'll say is, is this is a special sport that we're a part of. It's, it's truly genuine. Um, it teaches you a significant amount of life lessons. Uh, it creates a, a lot of great bonds. And it's, it's been special to me uh, because, you know, as a young kid, it was the first thing that I was really good at and I wanted to, you know, play it as much as possible. And, and so just understand the impact that you can have on so many people out there has something that has really transcended my vision on, on how I approach relationships uh, and how much I have evolved in the last 14 years of my life as leading this program. Um, it's okay to be humbled. Um, and it's most importantly, you've got to be grateful for every day you have an opportunity to be a part of this game. Um, and, and I hope a lot of people out there, uh, I don't know, learn a little bit uh, from today. Uh, please reach out to me uh, with any questions, comments. I'd be more than happy to have discussions with you. Uh, my email is wc2 at evansville.edu. Also, my Twitter handle is at westcarroll22. Please follow the University of Evansville uh, baseball program uh, in, in the years to come. Uh, we're looking for aces out there, uh, guys that want to come in and be a part of a blue-collar program that competes at a high level in Division One baseball. The Missouri Valley Conference, top to bottom, is, is such a fun, competitive, well-coached, well-played baseball conference in all aspects from on the mound, defensively, running the bases, and offensively. It's a special, special conference. 
uh, that I'm really proud to be a part of and coach against some of the best coaches in the country. Uh, it's always a challenge, fun, unique, and I learn off of them each and every time I go up against them. Um, but most importantly, uh, you know, we wear Evansville across our chest with pride and we want kids to come in and try to be a part of something bigger than themselves and then ultimately be a part of their career path and journey as, as having a wonderful student athlete experience that get, get, get a great education uh, to fall back on after they hopefully have an opportunity to play at the professional level. So uh, thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate it. It's so nice to get to know you. Uh, you're doing outstanding work. Uh, you know, I know you take time out of your day to day where you got a game uh, this afternoon to, to share uh, visions and try to help people learn in the game of baseball. So Thank you so much, and I want to wish you the best of luck. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.